In the past 10 years, online games have exploded. Now, it's almost expected for every AAA title to include some kind of online multiplayer, with many online games making nearly a billion dollars per year. And while we love them, they can also induce legendary rage from cheese tactics, lag, or just plain mean people on chat. But how are we able to play with people all over the world at the same time? Today, we'll take a look at the layers of networking that are the foundation of the internet itself and apply it to real-time games and matchmaking. So let's get started. All right, let's start with a familiar situation. You're playing a standard multiplayer game like Team Fortress 2 or League of Legends. You're looking to join a match, so you press play. An algorithm finds opponents and teammates for you. There'll be people who are looking for the exact type of match, and the selection may be based on a combination of factors like region and skill level. We'll look at these algorithms later. So you, your teammates, and your opponents will connect either to a dedicated server or to each other, known as a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Now, when I was younger, a server sounded like some strange, mystical internet machine, but they're essentially computers in warehouses that hold data, and users, or clients, can request that data, like when you access a web page. Dedicated game servers, however, will process you and your fellow players' inputs while you play your game. A dedicated server can ensure more reliable connections, since peer-to-peer -peer connection can force you to rely on the host's internet. This is why multiplayer games like League and Left 4 Dead 2 have servers so the game can continue even if some people drop in and out. Whereas in Dark Souls, if you disconnect after summoning or getting invaded by another player, the game no longer persists. So once some connection is established, all the player's computers are constantly sending information to each other so that the game is constantly updated. Think of a board game where each person takes a turn. They move their piece, roll a dice, then draw a card. Then the next person does their turn. In video games, everyone is constantly rolling dice and drawing cards many times a second. Or everyone is constantly moving their joystick or mouse and pressing buttons. But there's a missing piece here. How does my button mashing get sent to my opponent? The internet can often seem like a mysterious black box, but its core flow consists of seven key steps or layers, which I'm going to simplify quite a bit. So let's break down how your devastatingly good plays get sent across the world. Okay, first, the physical and data link layers. Wireless signals to your router are waves, and waves can represent a stream of zeros and ones, and any move you make in the game can be represented with zeros and ones. Next, at the network layer, this data is sent in a certain format called a packet. These packets start at you, the source, and find their destination according to, usually, the IP protocol. You've probably heard of IP addresses, which are four 8-bit numbers that are unique to your machine. Think of it almost like your computer's postal address. Now, the IP protocol is a specific method of sending your packets to the receiver using these addresses, though it doesn't guarantee that they'll come in order, among other things. To fix that, the next layer, the transport layer, also has different protocols or methods of delivering that information. TCP is very common and makes sure that packets are received in order and controls the rate the receiver gets data. Another protocol, UDP, does not always ensure a reliable transmission like TCP, but it has less overhead and may be used for real-time audio streaming, for example. So your computer has a unique IP address and about 60,000 TCP and UDP ports, which will accept connections for these transmissions. To give an example, websites usually try to connect to port number 80, while I remember Dark Souls 1 being on port 3074. If you've ever had to mess with port forwarding while trying to summon or invade people, that's what those numbers are. You could think of it like you have one cable box for your TV, but you get sent a lot of different channels, which are like the port numbers. 
But now let's jump to the application layer. If we're browsing the web, at this layer, we usually use HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol. If you click on a website, you submit an HTTP request to a server. So your request is formatted into a packet, which gets sent in waves to your router, which jumps from your internet service provider to that server. It then provides an HTTP response to you, the client. This is usually the website you requested, along with some information about the request itself, which you usually won't see. But if you've ever had a 404 or 501 error when trying to access a page, this means the response was unable to show you a web page, so you're seeing the HTTP response with its error codes. So hopefully understanding that process gives you insight on how simple connections work and how complicated they can be, because now we're going to apply this to games and more specifically, Dark Souls. Besides me being a huge fan, the Souls games are one of the few that use online gameplay to enhance the artistic vision and atmosphere. You have blood stains that mark spots where you can watch how other players died. You can summon players into your game or invade theirs. We don't think about how complex some of these systems are because the experience is pretty seamless and atmospheric unless you try to fight against the randomness and summon someone specific. So how does Dark Souls choose the messages and bloodstains you see? As soon as you start up your game, it initializes a pool of IP addresses. Whether you're in the menu or in the game, you'll get a new address in your pool every so often. For the comments, ghosts, and bloodstains, there's no special way they're chosen. It's not based on your location or your level. Someone from the US is just as likely to get an IP from Europe as they are from Canada. At least those are my experiences and those of the communities. But for actual matchmaking, for the summons and invasions or PVP and co-op, it's really simple. A lot of competitive games I mentioned earlier, like MOBAs, can have pretty mysterious and complex algorithms that I'll speculate on in a different video, but Dark Souls is really straightforward. For Dark Souls 1, your soul level had to be within about a plus or minus 10% range of the person you were summoning or invading. But for Dark Souls 2, they use soul memory, which is based on a bunch of things, but it was basically a number keeping track of how much you interacted with and succeeded in the game. Since Dark Souls is a game where a level 1 character could beat a level 100 character, soul memory was an attempt to look at the actual experience or skill of a player rather than strength by numbers. But your soul memory had to be within a very specific odd range, and you definitely needed to look it up on a table on the wiki to figure it out. Now I understand the intentions behind this change, but personally I found it much easier to coordinate with others in Dark Souls 1, but regardless of whether you're playing Dark Souls 1 or Dark Souls 2, if a character in your IP pool matches those requirements to summon them, for example, it'll show you their summon signs. If not, it'll keep giving you random IPs until you see something which is why it can take about 15 to 20 minutes of waiting before you might see your friend's sign. And if you've ever received the dreaded summoning failed, especially from a stranger, it could be a sign they're very far away from you and the sign you're seeing is a result of major lag. They could have been summoned or left the level by the time their sign appeared in your game. Now there's a specific item in Dark Souls 2 to remedy this a bit. A ring where you can choose a faction and you'll only see the signs of people from the same faction. This essentially filters your IP pool to greatly reduce wait time and frustration, although it's still funny to me that this is one of the few AAA series where you are simply not allowed to just play with friends. But hey, I guess that's just Dark Souls. Now there have been a ton of community mods and tools and research and fixes, so if anything, I hope this video gives everyone appreciation towards people in all game communities who do this dirty work. 
since this stuff can get really complicated and it's not super straightforward. So whatever community you associate yourself with, go thank your wiki contributors and mod makers. <laughs> Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what you think of this video and tell me what you'd like to see next, whether it's a new topic or more in-depth discussion on previous ones. So as always, have a happy day wherever you are. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.